Hello, everyone, and welcome to Vojdani University, episode two. Uh, we're delighted to have everyone watching again. Um, again, this is a monthly informational video series talking about the latest in medical news and literature as it relates to autoimmunity. Um, I am Elroy Vojdani, MD. I am the physician founder of Regenera Wellness, and my guest every month is my father, Aristo Vojdani. PhD. Uh, he is the president of Immunosciences Lab and the chief scientific advisor for Cyrex Laboratories. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you again. Thank you. I want to quickly recap what we talked about last month, which was, you know, uh, we're really laying the foundation for understanding autoimmunity here. And last month we covered the basics of autoimmunity, you know, what is it, uh, the history of it, um, and, you know, catching us up to um, our foundational understanding of autoimmunity today. Um, and in this month's episode, episode two, we're going to start to dive into the major categories um, that underlie the mechanism for autoimmunity in certain individuals. This month, we're going to be talking about, um, amongst other things, how food relates to autoimmunity which is a huge, uh, large topic, uh, one that we are currently writing a book on, actually, so look forward to that in the future. Um, let me start with a few questions, Dr. Bojdani. Please, go ahead. Uh, I can tell you from my personal experience uh, treating patients here in the clinic, and I'm sure your many, many years of experience, that um, autoimmunity is most definitely on the rise. It seems like a huge epidemic um, affecting the public, um, and numbers back that up as well. Why is autoimmunity so much on the rise? Okay. First of all, I'm glad you, as a physician, you accept that autoimmune diseases are on the rise. Of course. Because, because, sometimes, unfortunately, when we go to different meetings, uh, the way they describe that autoimmune, first of all, they may say autoimmune diseases are not on the rise. Right. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, they say, if autoimmune diseases are on the rise, it is because we can detect them better. Right. Okay? Now, I'm sorry, you may fool someone <laughs> who doesn't work in a laboratory settings, but you cannot fool this guy. Okay? Because I'm working for 50 years in research and clinical laboratory. Yeah. Especially last 30 years, I work in the immunology laboratory. Mm -hmm. I did thousands and thousands of tests for autoimmune diseases. Yeah. And as you know, you know, I'm still hands on. I'm yes. not one of those uh, no. that sit down and give an order to other people. No, you're still there every day running the test. Okay. I've Thank seen you, you do so it. Much. So, <laughs> so I'm doing anti-nuclear antibody. Yeah. I'm doing rheumatoid factor. I'm doing immune complexes, SSA, SSP, SM, RMP. So that this test has not changed. No. They are the same tests that we used to do 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and now. Yeah. Okay? So therefore, they cannot sell us, at least to us, that we have more autoimmune diseases because we can detect them better. Right. And unfortunately, they are using the same argument with autism, ADD, ADHD, with every single disease. Yeah. And that's why I get frustrated. Yeah. I remember uh, I was subject to the same thought as well. I remember very clearly, and I've talked to you about this before, that uh, when I was in medical school, I think my second year, we were taking a class and... Um, I came home, uh, I think, for dinner one weekend, and I looked at you and I said, autism spectrum disorder is on the rise because we are more attuned to it and are finding it more often than before. That's why the numbers um, are on the rise. Yes. And, you know, that's what was being taught to me in medical school. And, um, you know, that's a very, very common thought um, in this whole autoimmune and and um, really in the world of new diseases that we're seeing, um, you know, in the last 40, 50 years. And as I educated myself about it later on in my career, um, you know, I found out that that, that thought was incorrect, that if we're, it, it's not our detection mechanism. Right. It is actually the disease on the rise. Maybe small percentage. Sure. Very small percentage sure. is due to a better detection. Sure. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, so first, not so. Therefore, number one goal is to accept. Yes. Because if we don't accept, then we have a huge problem. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So first, we have to accept that autoimmune diseases are on the rise. I accept it. Okay. So you accept it. I hope you guys are accepting it. Then, if we after accepting that. Then we can say, what are the causes? Because the sooner we accept that autoimmune diseases, diseases are on the rise, and what are the causes of autoimmune diseases, we can do, certainly we can do something about it. Sure. We can help million and million of people. Yes. Did you know that just in America, we have 53 million suffer from autoimmune and associated disorders? Sure. That's a, a huge, huge number. Huge number. So the earlier they accept the role of environment in autoimmune diseases, the better we can help the patients. And again, let me say one more thing. That whatever we are talking in here, it's 100% evidence-based. Absolutely. You don't believe me? Sometimes we promise to share with you after every session three major articles. Sure. And so you are going to post those. Yeah, we'll post the link to the articles, those three articles. Um, on on the Facebook or YouTube post, depending okay. on which place so, you look for them. But you can find the links to the articles in the description uh, and details of the videos. And for those who are not really the scientists, just look at the title of the article. Example: Here, I'm going to share with you one article. Just you know, celiac disease is the best and the most classical example Absolutely. of autoimmune disease. Right. Okay. We'll talk about this some other time. But right now, just look at this. The celiac surge. What does that mean, Elroy? That means that we're seeing massively increased numbers of people coming in with celiac disease. We're not even talking about non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but celiac disease is massively on the rise, um, especially in the last 20 years. And this is in the scientist yes. or scientific American or yes. the scientist. Major, major journal. So here, finally, you know, remember 20 years ago, I was saying that, you know, autoimmune disease is on the rise due to environmental triggers. So finally, at least about celiac disease, they say, well, we used to have only 1% of the population with celiac disease. Yes. Now it's 3%. Yeah, huge. Okay, so yeah. that 200% increase. Yes. Right? So then finally they say, now we think the environment is playing a role. Mm -hmm. okay. They're finally accepting that idea. They're finally accepting the idea, yeah. the environment playing a role. And again, don't forget, 3% celiac disease, but we have another 20 to 30% may have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Absolutely. But we'll talk about that in different programs. But our point is, everything that we discuss um, is evidence-based, you know, published in large journals. And, you know, in our experience, there has been um, some hesitancy built into the medical system in the United States to incorporate new discoveries, new understandings of disease, new treatment paradigms, and um, in this case, uh, new mechanisms of causality into the treatment paradigm. And, um, you know, we're doing our best to educate and to really shorten that gap so that these effective treatments can be incorporated into people's everyday health. And, and ultimately, the goal here is to reduce suffering. Yeah, and this is the principle of functional medicine. Yes. It's all based on strong scientific data. Um, and, you know, really looking at that data um, with the same scrutinous eye that you would look at any medical journal data, you know, and the, many of the articles that we base our treatment on are in, you know, the same journal side by side with the pharmaceutical company's trials. So, right. um, you know, it, it, it's uh, sometimes it takes... Um, a little bit of a challenge to accept new ideas and we're trying to bring scientifically based new ideas into people's lives. Beautiful. Okay. So we accept it. Okay. Autoimmunity is uh, on the rise. rise. And the environment playing a significant role. Okay. So that's the next question everyone always asks. What percentage of autoimmunity is genetic and what percentage is environmental? Okay. Based on twin studies okay. done 
at different research centers, including National Institutes of Health. Okay, the NIH. Yes, NIH. You know, you know the the, the highest level possible. Sure. You know, uh, they took twins, identical twins. Okay. And followed them for many years. Okay. And found out that if one twin had an autoimmune disease, the probability of the second twin to have the same autoimmune disease, in some cases, was only 10%. Okay. Only 10% very in some low. cases. In some cases, 60%. Okay, very high. Then they combined the 10 plus 60, that's almost 70, and they came out actually with the following figure. One third of autoimmune diseases are genetics. One third. Meaning are associated with specific genes. For example, HLA B27. Right. Spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis. Exactly. Yes. But that doesn't mean that if you carry HLA B27, 100% you are going to get. Okay. Spondylitis, ankylosing spondylitis. It just makes you predisposed to the condition. What's the rest right. of it? Celiac disease. Wait a second. Let's, you know, for the sake of argument. Okay, get, please. You know. uh, celiac disease. It depends on HLA DQ2, right. DQ8. Right. What percentage, of, of what percentage of population is HLA DQ2 and HLA DQ8 positive? Between 45 to 48 percent. Okay. of the population. Huge number. What is the person celiac disease? 3%. 3%. Yes. So why the other 42% do not get celiac disease? Yeah. That is telling us that even you if you have a gene for certain disease unless the environment of triggers somehow pulling, you know, the trigger in the gun. Yes. You are not going to get autoimmune disease. Right. So again, even for genetic makeup, still you need the environmental trigger to activate the gene in order to result in autoimmune disease. So in these people, the gene is like the bullet, but something still has to pull the trigger. That's right. Okay. You can have thousands of guns with a bullet inside right and you put them in the closet. What is going to happen? Nothing. That's you know, meaning that for example, if I have I'm HLA B27. So mm -hmm. what? Right. I have to get some kind of exposure to toxic chemicals. Some kind of food that I may eat will not be good for me. Or I get certain infection, an ear infection, a throat infection. Then that can trigger the disease resulting in autoimmunity. Okay. And by the way, autoimmune disease, it's not a disease that we sleep tonight. Tomorrow morning, we wake up with autoimmune disease. It takes 10, 20 to 30 years to develop an autoimmune disease. Absolutely. So the role of environmental triggers is playing almost in 100% of the cases. Sure. That's the argument I'm making now. Right. So gene by itself is not enough. So according to, to those studies, they say a third of it is contributed to by genetics, two thirds of it by environment, um, but really to, to really understand that more, um, it's really important to understand the concept that without the environmental components that the genes themselves can't, uh, just to have a genetic subtype doesn't mean you're gonna have a disease or a genetic uh, single nucleotide polymorphism doesn't mean that you're gonna have the disease. You need the environment to, uh, to be able to trigger that into an actual disease. 100%, right? the, one of the best example, and this is a simple one, to understand that many people may have uh, genetic makeup or family history uh -huh. of multiple sclerosis. Sure. But when you live in the area that you are vitamin D deficient, D3 deficient, the D3 deficiency, because vitamin D playing such an important role yep. in regulation of the immune system. Yep then lack of vitamin D could activate, you know, that cascade that results in multiple sclerosis. Absolutely. So something so simple, lack of vitamin D 
is involved not only in MS, in many autoimmune diseases. And therefore, when you go to your uh, practitioners, please listen to that doctor. When he or she measuring your vitamin D and your vitamin D is low, try to get the level of vitamin D as high as possible. Yeah, and, and it's really unbelievable um, you know how many people come into the office and, and vitamin D is a very easily accessible routine test available through all the major labs um, it's quick turnaround time within 24 hours for most labs um, and it's inexpensive you know this is something that is a very easy tool um, as long as you understand how important it is and the number of people that come into the office I can speak from personal experience with vitamin D levels that are less than 20, I mean, you know, very, very low numbers is huge. And, um, you know, it, it's important to understand how big of a setup this is for numerous diseases in the future, not just autoimmune disease. Yes. So, so we accepted the role of environment. Yes. According to NIH, one third is the gene, two third environmental factors mm -hmm. just for the sake of argument let's now accept that completely not saying 100 percent of autoimmune diseases are due to environmental triggers one-third gene two-third environmental chemicals but we can do something about it yes practitioners dr elroy you can do something about yes. the other two-third yeah our environment is something that we have complete control over Yes. It, sometimes there are things that are very difficult, they're difficult to change. But if you think about it, our environment is really something that we have 100% control over, which is very unique in the health world. Um, so once we accept the idea that our environment plays such a significant role in our health, particularly in autoimmune disease, we can start making conscious decisions about what we are exposed to and alter the course of that disease. In many cases, reverse it. Exactly. Right. So what are the factors responsible for the surge of autoimmune disease. Yes. Number one, stress. Absolutely. Okay. So you want to elaborate more about that? We are living in the in a world of stress, daily stress. Yeah. Uh, you know. And and you know the rat race used to be you know an eight to five or nine to five, nine to six, nine to seven, depending on your job. And you clock out and you go home and if anyone needed to reach you, you know, good luck trying to find you on a telephone. And that was it. And, uh, you know, I, I think a big contribution to the increased amount of stress is also the fact that um, our work follows us everywhere now. And we have devices that connect us to work and everything else all the time. And, and disconnecting is something that you have to consciously do now. And also disconnect from the... Uh from the yes. people, from the environment. Yes. Yeah. That by itself is very stressful. It is very stressful. We just heard, for example, that uh, Whole Foods was acquired by Amazon. Is yeah. that the good news or bad news? For the business, <laughs> maybe it's a good news. But for us, I don't want to sit at home and to deliver my uh, groceries. Yeah. No. I want to get out. Yeah. I want to see people. Yeah. I want to talk to people. Go to your farmer's market, talk to people, yeah. talk to them about where they got the produce from, talk to them about the love and care they put into the produce, and you can take that love and care back to your home and incorporate it into your diet. And uh, yeah, I agree with you. Convenience yeah. is not always good for you. Absolutely. So stress, we know that we already, in the textbook of medicine, they told us that the stress is affecting HPA axis. Yep. And what is HPA axis? Isn't that all the hormones? It is all of them. Well, almost, almost all of them. Almost, almost. Very important. And later on, we'll talk about male and female differences yes. in autoimmune diseases. Yeah. So the hormones directly can suppress or depends on their concentration and their type or can activate different cascades yeah. associated with autoimmunity. Absolutely. So stress can activate HPA axis and increasing some hormones, decreasing the other hormones, and definitely contributes to some autoimmune diseases. The message or uh, take home message is uh, 
we can do something about it, right? Absolutely. Exercise, meditation. Yes. Why, why all of that is helping patients with autoimmune diseases? Yeah, because it's a very conscious disconnect from all of the stress of life. If you sit down and you take 90 minutes to go to a yoga class, you are taking 90 minutes to disconnect from the craziness of life and have those 90 minutes just for you to kind of restore balance and decrease stress. I, that's really the basis behind all of these things. They are conscious ways of disconnecting from all the stress, which everyone needs to do. And, and I think these days it's becoming more and more difficult to do. So we need to do these things. So if I had a, you know, a piece of paper and, and you know, take a note or to take a note of what we already said, so let's say autoimmune diseases are on the rise. Okay, we accepted that. Yes. Factor number one, please write stress. Okay. Factor number two. Okay. Factor number two. You know, since 1930s, mm -hmm. after discovery of antibiotics, yeah. antibiotics help to save millions of people. Yeah. Antibiotics help to get rid of uh, antibiotics and even vaccinations together. Get rid of uh, uh, typhoid, mm -hmm. uh, tuberculosis, polio, measles, and name it. Sure. Millions of, and millions of people used to die from infectious agents. Absolutely. So thanks for that discovery, now we have less infectious agents and less people are dying from infectious agents as an acute cause of death yes yeah yes but there's a price unfortunately we are paying mm -hmm. for that the overuse of antibiotics caused huge change in human microbiome yes and if you will go online and do search and try to find the connection between human microbiome and autoimmune diseases, believe me, you are going to find more than 10,000 articles published in the best scientific journals. No one can argue with that, that our microbiome playing a role in health and autoimmune diseases. Absolutely. Good microbiome, such as lactobacilli, yeah. is helping us to prevent autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. The bad bacteria, E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter jejuni, and name it, others, that by releasing toxins can change the gut integrity, the gut barrier, and finally inflammation. And that inflammation starts the fire in our body, which five to 10 or 20 years later can result in autoimmunity. Yeah. So the human microbiome, change in the human microbiome due to overuse of antibiotics, and I'm going to add to that in general, medications. Yeah. Many times, believe me, we don't need to use all these medications that our doctor sometimes they prescribe. Remember, medications, this is, this is the, um, the scientist is talking, okay? Not the MD, the doctor. The scientist is telling you that use medication only 100% if it's necessary because medications are toxic chemicals. But we use them in order to prevent diseases. But use them at the level of minimal, minimal as possible. I agree. Okay. So that's those are the factors so we said the stress change of human microbiome and then the next one is let me start with put it this way call that unhealthy pregnancies okay so now there is a proof that a child born and having type 1 diabetes at age 4 or 5 yes. 
everything started when he was in the womb or she was in the womb. Okay. The baby was in the womb. Because the state of the, whether the sperm is healthy or not healthy, the egg plus the environment when the fetus is growing, meaning the diet of the mother, mm -hmm. uh, how much toxic chemicals are in the blood of the mother or in the tissue of the mother because that reflection those chemicals also right. can get there was that big study a couple of years ago that looked at uh, um, placental blood um, immediately uh, after birth and found that there were over 190 chemicals in placental blood I mean just a very scary number um, in another study was seven, uh, almost 96 percent of children had Bisphenol A, which is the plastic in the right. urine, right? Which is endocrine disruptor. Children. Children. Yeah. yeah. So, so everything. Why am, am I discussing with you guys? Because if you are young people like Elroy, who just got married a few months ago, and you are planning to have a child, please go to a specialist to pre prepare you not only mentally medically to have you know to get ready to have a child and and you're talking about doing um the things that we're talking about which is be conscious of what in your environment can be contributing to poor health and you know just make changes to remove these things we're not talking about uh you know medication or anything like that but it's really just about education and consciously making decisions about yeah. what you're exposed to yeah number one remove the toxins from your body absolutely okay Number two, you have no choice but go on organic diet. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Of course. Okay, so that's... that's organic as much as possible. Okay, now, hopefully that child is born healthy, C-section or natural birth. Natural birth is... Always, vaginal birth is always preferred, I think, um, you know, because we're introduced to vaginal flora on our way out, and that's what starts the initial inoculation um, of our gut microbiome, which exactly is a huge factor in all of our health for the future. Um, and there have been some recent articles talking about uh, a window, really, of opportunity of opportunity in the neonatal period, just immediately after birth for the first couple months. Was it ninety day window? Yes, ninety day window that really sets up a body for life you know as as far as what diseases may be affecting us um so and this was in journal of immunology yes. 2017 about three months ago i think i'll put a link to that article in the description as well it's an excellent article everyone should read it but uh so what you're saying is during during right before pregnancy during pregnancy and maybe the third the three months right after pregnancy are really the most important times in a human being's life and um, you know in this world we're exposed to so many toxic chemicals all over us uh, in our food we need to be making some conscious decisions to really affect the lives of our children um, you know hopefully to be long and healthy and without any of these issues that we're talking about yeah absolutely next next item is breastfeeding or baby formula what do you think <laughs> Breastfeeding, a hundred percent, obviously. So uh, you know, we're we're born without the ability to produce antibodies immediately, correct? As our immune Absolutely. system matures, and really our immune system, uh, you know, our our secondary immune system beyond the innate immune system, um, comes from our mother's breast milk. And uh, you know, imagine how many new things our body is being exposed to. We're out of the womb air, you know, dirt, bacteria, you know, constantly babies are touching the ground and then their mouth. They're being exposed to new pathogens, potentially, or good bacteria that they've never been exposed to. And they don't have a developed immune system to be able to produce antibodies or detect which one is good, which one is bad. So all of that comes from the antibodies present in our mother's breast milk. It is our defense mechanism against everything in the outside world until our own immune system develops. That Another ability. meaning another meaning you are talking about immune fitness yes okay yeah you know the, you, the immune system has to exercise right has to be exposed to all of that <clears throat> yeah in order to build 
strong immune right. system. It's good that it's exposed to everything. Absolutely. But Absolutely. it needs some support along the way. Absolutely. Yeah. So there is no doubt that breastfeeding is one of the most important factors. Length? And How long? At How least long? six months. At least six months. Okay. Yeah. And I understand that some ladies may not have at all uh, milk and they have no choice, but there are at least now some better alternatives. For mm -hmm. example, um, hydrolyzed casein, yeah. which is European companies now came out with some type of formulas. It's much more protective uh, against autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. And one of the most classical autoimmune diseases, as you know, it's type 1 diabetes. Yes. And they, there is a connection. It's published heavily in the scientific journal that baby formula and beta casein and its structure and similarity between casein and islet cell antigens is associated with development of type 1 diabetes. Yeah. So that's why baby formula is not recommended at least for six months and uh, until the immune the, system has developed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At least the immune fitness is completely in place. Okay. What else uh, we... Okay, so all of that, all of that indirectly you talked about is contributing to gut microbiome. Yeah. And then you touched upon also the hygiene hypothesis. Yes. So the child now is one year or two year. Please do not be protective of the baby. At the child. Do not wash the child's hand every few seconds mm -hmm. or every few times a day. The child has to be exposed to bacteria from the earth, uh, from our skin, know, from yeah, you know, because that is going to activate the cells involved in immune fitness. Right. So. They looked at children who raised in a farm, right? Mm -hmm. Versus children raised in the city. Yeah. Children raised in farm, they get less autoimmune disease. Less asthma, less autoimmune disease. Less asthma, disease, less allergy. Res and respiratory all illnesses. And so therefore, please do not be protective of your children. Let them to be exposed to the nature. Yeah. That, that's the hygiene hypothesis. Okay. And the hygiene hypothesis was developed almost uh, about 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, almost we talked 30 about years that. Ago. Yeah. And uh, exposure to bacteria or bacterial antigens from the environment activating the immune system. So uh, the body will have all the cells involved in the immune system which are in a balanced state. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, we call that TH1 and TH2. With Treg in the middle. And the Treg in the middle, exactly. Yeah. So we want this, you know, this balance could be, should be 100%. No TH1 dominant and no TH2 dominant. Right. Okay, that's why the Treg cell is playing such an important role in here. And we talked about vitamin D earlier, and one of the major things that vitamin D does is it supports Treg homeostasis, right? So Because there is a receptor. Right. For vitamin D and T Rex cells, which keeps that balance of the immune system. Yes. Okay. So that that was number three. And the next one is big, big one. Exposure to toxic environmental chemicals. Okay. Unfortunately, a Chemicals are everywhere. We talked about that uh, children have 700 different chemicals in their urine. Yeah. And that was done in 1985. Yeah. And they stopped doing that because probably they were so embarrassed. <laughs> Too embarrassed. controversial. Yeah. And so I believe if today we'll take urine or blood from every individual and test for all the chemicals, which are 100,000 of chemicals in our environment introduced since 1940, until today, we'll find more than 
5,000 in our blood or in our urine. Yeah. But no one has done that study right. because they cannot look for 100,000 different chemicals. Sure. Sure. And by the way, only 5% of those were tested for safety before their introduction into any products, whether it is, it is soap, shampoo, detergent, or solvents. Yeah. So be aware of the toxic chemicals. And uh, there are many, many articles published in the scientific journals who talked about the rise of autoimmunities are associated with exposure to food additives, for yeah. example. Uh, and food additives are many of them. Colors? Yes. Gums? Yes. Salts and, and uh, flavor enhancers? Yes. Right? Uh, binding agents? Yes. Food glue, meat glue. Um, there are many, many, many of them. Preservatives. Uh, there's an endless list of food additives in the uh, industrialized food world that we live in today, unfortunately. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the products that we are using on a daily basis, uh, fruits, vegetables, air, water, uh, the household cleaners. Yeah. Um, you know, in the kitchen, whatever we are using, you know, Teflon. Sure. Uh, one of my, it, one of my favorite things that uh, Jeff Bland talks about all the time is uh, chlorine in, in our tap water, right? Um, you know, uh, thankfully the city of Los Angeles, which we live in, is uh, starting to adopt um, non-chemical means of uh, sterilizing tap water, which I commend them for. I think it's a great thing. I, I hope that all major cities do that. But in the meantime, until that's fully up, chlorine is added to tap water to... Um, help sterilize it to make it safer consumption and uh, I don't think anyone's ever made you know the the large-scale um, study. thought study about listen chlorine is designed to kill bugs and if you're ingesting it what is it doing to your gut microbiome um, yes exactly no doubt it's altering your gut microbiome uh, in you know it, I heard Jeff Bland mentioned that in his book um, uh, the Disease Delusion, if anyone hasn't read it, it's a fantastic book. And uh, we've also, you know, we have the, the real honor of knowing him personally, and he's Absolutely. mentioned it many times in person. And, um, you know, these are things that unless you become aware of, you really don't know to make decisions one way or the other. And I can't fault anyone for, for not knowing about these things, but we're here to educate you so that these decisions can be made and ultimately a healthier life can be lived. Okay, the last one. Okay. Okay. Uh, leakiness of the immune system. Yeah. This is a new terminology I'm going to use and give me credit for this in the future. You have credit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> leakiness of the immune system. What is leakiness of the immune system? Okay. We said the child is born, right? The child with no immune system. As soon as get exposed to uh, vaginal bacteria, uh, mother's skin, uh, milk, breastfeeding, and all of that, uh, the immune system start become activated. Mm -hmm. And one of the major cells which becomes activated and is going to be part of the immune system is regulatory T cell, the one that has receptors for vitamin A or car carotenoids and vitamin D sure. and cruciferous vegetables. Mm -hmm. So T-Rex cell, what is the job of T-Rex cells? To teach our mucosal immune system, which is part of the GI tract, to live in harmony with food that we eat on a daily basis, and also the friendly bacteria in our gut. That's one, one level. Yeah. So that's... In, in your famous diagram, it's the police officer, right? Right. That's, we, that's a mucosal immune system. Yes. Now, there are two more levels that protecting us against all immunity. So T-Rex cells in the gut, yep. protecting us against autoimmunity. Now, the two more levels are 
central tolerance, and the third level is peripheral tolerance. Right. So what is central tolerance? Lymphocytes migrate from bone marrow yeah. to our thymus gland in order to get their education. Mm -hmm. Lymphocytes which migrate from the bone marrow to the thymus do not have any identity. They are just lymphocytes. Right. <clears throat> They are, the meaning is they are not differentiated. Sure. Totally. Yeah. So they are not T helper one, T helper two, T helper three, or T rex. Right. So after migration into the thymus, in the thymus they get their education. Right. So any lymphocyte with a receptor for self tissue. will be eliminated from our body completely. Right. Any lymphocytes that have receptors for self tissue. That's right. Meaning if they were released into the wild, they would attack self tissue, yes. which the immune system has a mechanism to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's to eliminate them in the thymus. That's right. And any lymphocytes who carry receptors for viruses, bacteria, parasites, and other foreign materials, they have to survive. Yeah and they become activated soldiers who protect us against any foreign material in the future. Yes. So this is the second level. Yep. The third level is peripheral tolerance. Some of those cells which migrated from the thymus into the circulation and into the tissue, they become T-Rex cells also in the blood right. and in the tissue. Right. And their role is to regulate the immune system. So in case, for example, a certain cell escaped the thymus gland and have a receptor for thyroid tissue, mm -hmm. the T-Rex cells, by producing immunosuppressive cytokines, such as TGF-beta and IL-10, is going to keep that cell completely um, in, uh, you know, not to be active. Right. And therefore, that cell is not going to harm the body. Right. So suppressing, yeah, incapacitated. Right. right. Thank you. So the T Rex cells, by releasing all these ammunitions, they are going after autoreactive T cells, and autoreactive T cells becomes incapacitated. Right. So, if any of these three will fail, meaning our oral tolerance mechanism will fail, our central tolerance will fail, or our peripheral tolerance will fail, the results could be autoimmunity. And this is the meaning of immune leakiness or leaky immune system. Right. So please add leaky immune system to leaky gut and leaky blood brain barriers. Right. Together, these three factors probably are the most important one responsible for induction of autoimmune diseases, including neuroautoimmunities, meaning autoimmune diseases in the brain. Yeah. So those are the five major um, factors which are responsible for the rise of uh, autoimmunities. And again, all those factors which we talked about, stress, right? Yeah. We talked about uh, the hygiene hypothesis. We talked about the, the bacteria. Pre prenatal period. All of those. Yeah. And we talked about uh, exposure to toxic chemicals. Yeah they can affect the function of the thymus gland. They can affect the T-Rex cells in the gut. Absolutely. And so therefore, together, contribute to the leakiness of the immune system, which goes hand in hand with leaky gut and leaky blood-brain barrier. Absolutely. 
So I think you know that's a good summary of uh, uh, what factors are contributing, what are the environmental factors right. contributing to the rise of our immunities. Of course, stress probably is going to affect also that. Absolutely. And, and uh, we have, uh, you know, through the years and years of re research, specific mechanisms uh, in the food category, in the chemicals category, um, in the infectious category of, of how these things lead to the breakdown of the immune system and to a leaky immune, to a leaky immune system and then to autoimmunity. And we'll go into several of these mechanisms in specific diseases in the future as we go category by category. Um, but that's an excellent overview and, and really um, a lot of great detail into understanding how autoimmune disease is really happening and how in our environment is contributing so much to it. Um, you know, to wrap up episode two, um, we really talked a lot about why autoimmunity is on the rise, why it's becoming this huge health epidemic. And, uh, you know, the take home message is that um, sure, genetics can play a part into who is susceptible to autoimmune disease, but the biggest factor is our environment. Yes. And that's excellent news because that is something that we have 100% control over. Now, it, it, that may be a difficult concept to understand, but you have, as you become educated and can make decisions about what you're exposed to, have 100% control over your environment, right? Yes. So autoimmune disease is a huge topic of discussion, but we're hoping as we start to understand it more and more and, and we educate more people that this will be uh, an epidemic of the past. Yes. So I thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure. Next time, we are going to talk about why the immune system of the male is from Mars, but the immune system of the female is from Venus. Okay. That's a title of an article that you are going to post so that we'll read it for the next episode. I like that. And uh, so we're going to be talking about the differences um, really in uh, male uh, prevalence rates and female prevalence rates in autoimmunity. Uh, anyone who's been treating autoimmune disease will tell you that females are way more affected than males are. But we're going to go into why. Yes. Um, and that'll be a great gateway into our discussion of our next topic, which will be also uh, how chemical exposure relates to specific mechanisms of autoimmune disease and what can be done about it. Absolutely. Thank you, Elroy. My pleasure. Just a plug for both of us. Uh, we will both be speaking at the A4M National Conference this year in the middle of December in Las Vegas uh, on day one um, general session. Um, both of us will be speaking in the afternoon. I will be talking about SIBO, um, which uh, I'm very excited to be doing. And one of your session, one of your lectures that day will be about the rise and the fall of zonulin for detection of leaky gut. Well, I'm very excited, very much looking forward to that. Uh, for those of you out there, we encourage you to come to A4M this year. It's going to be a great conference, and we're looking forward to speaking. Um, but. Uh, as always, I'll uh, send any suggestions for future topics to info at regenerowellness.com. Uh, you can visit my website at www.regenerowellness.com. Um, if anyone out there would like to call, uh, make a consultation with me, all the uh, phone number information is available on the website. Uh, and thank you so much for tuning in. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bushdani. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you next month. Thank you. See you.